On behalf of Arson Canada and Intricity, welcome to Reimagine, an opportunity for us to examine life's new questions. As a means of introduction, my name is Alana Walker Carpenter, and I will be your host today. Whether you have a little faith, a lot of faith, or no faith at all, we hope that this will be a safe landing ground as we explore success from the context of results versus relationships. To begin today, uh, my colleague Andy will begin with a talk and following that, my colleague Jeremy and I will jump into the conversation so we can have a robust question and answer period in a full panel. For those of you who are engaged in social media, our hashtag is reimagine2020. And for those of you who do want to ask a question today, simply click on the right hand side of your screen and those will come directly to us. It is my pleasure to introduce to you both Andy and Jeremy. Andy is the director of Festival of Thought. Andy previously has served in a number of private equity firms within the UK. He is recently married to Rachel. He serves on the board of trustees for a not-for-profit organization and has a background playing rugby. And Jeremy Monroe, Jeremy is presently an analyst at TD Securities. Jeremy recently graduated from Queen's University with a Bachelor's of Commerce with distinction. As I mentioned, he's presently serving at TD. And outside of that role, um, he helps his family with their charitable foundation. So welcome to Andy and welcome Jeremy. And over to you, Andy. All right. Um Oh, thank you, Alana, for that kind introduction, and hey to everyone on the call. Thank you so much for taking some time out of the middle of a busy working day to consider some of these big questions that this series of talks is going to work through. And it's really an honor for me to get to kick things off today. Uh, quite a lot of ground to cover, and so I'm going to have to speak very quickly. And with my Irish accent, you think, who is this leprechaun bouncing around in my screen if that happens, just please try and stick with me, and I promise there will be a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. That's the worst joke you'll hear all day, but it's probably the best one I'm going to tell. Now, I don't know um, where you would begin uh, trying to describe what we've been through in the past few months. The coronavirus pandemic seems not so much to be an event in history as much as it seems to be a history-making event. And maybe the same way that we refer to the world in terms of pre and post the world wars, pre and post the Berlin Wall, pre and post 9-11, we might now refer to the world as pre and post COVID-19. Many people have suffered in all sorts of ways. And yet for as many people who have suffered, there are others who through it all feel that somehow this experience has created space to reevaluate life, to think about how and why we're living and what sorts of things might be the most important from this point onwards. The whole thing is a really complex picture. It's kind of like some profound tapestry with all sorts of brown patches and horrible colors, the sickness and death that we've seen the inequalities and injustices that have been brought to light in our societies, the erosion really of the stories we thought our lives were part of. And yet those brown patches, those difficult things are interwoven with things that look like slightly brighter colors or what even could be described as silver linings. How we have come together and shown solidarity in all sorts of unexpected ways and how we've shown that we care for the vulnerable in our society much more than we might have thought we did. We've seen that the world hasn't stopped spinning since we've stopped flying everywhere and we've been heartened by the efforts of so many inspirational healthcare workers and volunteers in all sectors of the economy pulling together, putting others before themselves. It's a really complex picture and just looking at that picture trying to study it, to reflect on it before we turn away and live the rest of our lives, we have an opportunity just to ask ourselves, are we seeing things the right way? 
have we understood that big picture and what that big picture might require of us? Because at times in life, the things happening in the world out there, so to speak, can inform a sense of wanting to respond more personally and directly in terms of the world in here. And we get invitations to question the things our culture has enshrined as a definition of success before now, and to ask in the light of COVID whether those ideas continue to be things we should believe or whether they need reimagined. When things come into view that we've never really had to process before, it makes sense just to take off the glasses through which we were looking at the world, focus on the thing we're trying to understand what it is, and then ask, do we need to readjust our lenses or even get a completely new set of glasses? Some things in the picture have changed. It feels like some things have come into view which indicate reality might be a bit different to what we thought it was. And before the pandemic, many of us working in business tended to look at the world through a pretty specific lens. A lens which gave or gives a certain interpretation of events and helps arrive at a certain definition of success. And we might refer to this lens um, as the results-based view. The idea uh, that success is about hitting some description of a target, whether in business or in life, some description of a target, and all targets can be reduced to material terms. If business is retail, then success is selling a certain number of units. If business is banking, then success is hitting a rate of return and so on and so forth. Success in our own lives, according to the results-based view, is about hitting this or that set of goals or objectives. And in our careers overall, it's about translating whatever we take to be the fullest extent of our potential into whatever the nearest market proxy to the value of our life might be, because the market pays us what we're worth. We put in the work, we enjoy the results. At a societal level, the results-based view looks at every problem, even moral problems, as issues to be addressed through market principles and ever-expanding definitions of economics. So whether it's healthcare, education, climate change, getting people to quit smoking or live beside runways or beside noisy factories, everything, even moral concerns, can be reduced to material terms. It gives rise to an understanding of ethics, ethics, a vogue conversation in business, which says that what we need to do is get enough people in business or wherever to do enough good things, enough of the time measured by some KPI, and then hopefully by a process of osmosis, our economy, and by extension, our society is going to fix itself. Injustice, inequality, whatever our biggest problems are, we can rely on the market to fix it. And no one has to reflect on their own character. But ethics understood in that way seems to fall a little bit short of what we tend to think full morality would require. It seems that there's more to morality than a box ticking exercise or the intellectual challenge of creating this or that structure to incentivize this or that behavior that we think is going to induce the osmosis that we're looking for. At some point or other, morality seems to require more like a giving of ourselves, a giving of our heart, um, a set of calculations, you might say, with a different set of input assumptions. Because what seems clear um, in this new tapestry of life, 
that we're looking at is that on the individual level to start with that, actually, we are just not in control of our lives the way that we thought we were. We're not the masters of our own destiny. Families have been shown to need each other. We need each other. Different groups of people in the economy have been shown that they really need and rely on each other to come through. And many of us uh, working from home, um, everyone pivoting to flexible working during this lockdown period. Well, so many people have said that it's brought around a kind of sense of appreciation of getting to spend a little bit more time with loved ones, feeling fresh, um, kind of appreciation and seeing our spouses, our friends, uh, our wider community in a new and beautiful light, getting to put the kids to bed at night, having time to slow down, we're relieved of commuting stress and we actually can just eat lunch. The whole thing has just felt uh, like a breath of pure oxygen and it's been about our relationships. If that's the individual level, then on a societal level, we're seeing something really similar. Evidence, perhaps, that looking at moral issues only through the lens of results and economics doesn't work. The algorithms have pretty much exploded because of an irreducible factor that we've come across. The desire that we've been unable to suppress to protect human life and to shield the vulnerable through this pandemic. Governments right across the world have for the most part taken decisions which defy explanation when we look at the world only through the lens of the results-based view. I was reading an article the other day uh, talking about how here in the UK, the, the UK NHS would normally evaluate its decisions through a metric it refers to as a life hour saved. So how much in financial terms would the NHS be prepared to put away in order to save one hour of someone's life? And that gets adjusted for age and prospects and all the variables that you might expect. And typically the figure that the NHS puts on it is around 20,000 GBP. But during this coronavirus pandemic, looking at the amount of debt that's been issued as a ratio of the number of live hours that have been saved, the multiple, the figure that's been paid comes out at multiple many times um, the normal figure. More people are alive than might have been, but yes, more businesses are closed than might have been. And the economic road ahead is far more challenging than it might have been. But that question, what amount of life is worth? What amount of economic pain? And the difficulty answering shows the results-based view of the world falls short of life's biggest questions. There seems to be an irreducible quality above and beyond the results-based view. And that irreducible quality seems to exist in the realms of relationship. But what explains it? Well, one underlying reason why a results-based view cannot and will never quite stretch to bring us the success we're looking for in life in all its fullness is that every time we look at things that way, our view of reality is obscured. Or maybe a slightly better word for it is reduced. Because through the results-based view, the only things that can be seen are objects. Even when we look at people, the results-based view turns subjects into objects. And John Green, in his prize-winning book, Looking for Alaska, put his finger on this issue in a really profound way. He said, people were created to be loved. Things were created to be used. The reason the world is in chaos is because things are being loved and people are being used. Really often, the objectifying reductionistic effect of the results-based view leads 
to the sacrifice of relationship. But in sacrificing relationship, results feel much more hollow. Results maybe even mean nothing. Um, in the introduction, it was mentioned that I got married um, six weeks ago, as it happens. And in the run up to the big day, like most grooms, um, I was pretty unsure of what it was I should say in the big speech, the groom's speech, the moment everyone's waiting for. And I'm trying to think, how do I keep family happy? How do I say all the right things here? How do I keep Rachel happy? How do I say all the things to please her? And so imagine that in all my busyness and all of my nervousness about trying to get this thing right, I come across an advert on the internet which says I can purchase the perfect speech for $50. I can have the market solve my problem. And this speech is gonna be complete with lots of lovely anecdotes about Rachel, guaranteed to pull a few tears. It's got that perfect balance between heartfelt sincerity and also humor just to keep people laughing. It's got everything. Well, this would be the perfect speech and I'd certainly get the result that I was after, that any groom is hoping for. But wouldn't you say there just feels to be something hollow about that? The box was ticked, yeah, but my soul was absent. And what would my wife rather have? What we're looking at here what the tapestry of our recent experiences seems to suggest is that the deepest fabric of what life is really all about is not material. It is moral. And success in a post-COVID world is not so much about the old view of results, but in fact, what lies beyond that in relationships. Now, of course, who of us would have gone out before the pandemic and said anything different? Who would actually have admitted to thinking that life was really only about results and material gain? And of course, we know that relationships are important. We do strive for a healthy work rhythm and do what we can in terms of relationships. It's just that there always seems to be a tension we never quite seem to be able to resolve that tension as if there's going to be something about results and relationship that are forever incompatible. Now, this is where I find the teaching of Jesus to be very interesting. He spoke a lot about the tension we feel between results and relationship. One of the most famous stories he told was a story about two sons uh, that asked their father to give them their inheritance while he was still alive. In other words, they wished him dead, the ultimate sacrifice of relationship or material gain. And one of these boys, he goes off and he spends his money on wild material pursuits, taking that individualist ideology to the extreme. And the other son, well, he stays at home. And according to the KPIs of his day, he looks like a far more ethical person. The point of the story, though, is not to criticize material things. There's a recognition that we need that to get by. The point of the story is that neither of those sons and both of their definitions of success, neither of them valued relationship with their father. Relation, uh, relationship featured nowhere in their definition of success. And an interesting point about this story is that in the West, we call it the story of the prodigal son. But in the Middle East, and not forgetting that that's the audience Jesus originally told it for, the story is referred to as the story of the running father. Because of the lengths the father goes to, to restore relationship. When the younger son realizes that he's messed up, he comes home and the father runs out to greet him and to some extent disgracing himself in the process. And in that moment, relationship is 
restored. But the son also gets a ring on his finger, a robe on his back, and a party to celebrate. It turns out that the result he was always looking for was to be found in relationship all along. What's worth noting about the targets and objectives we have and set for ourselves in life and what kind of perpetuates the results-based view is that most of these targets and objectives, we don't see them as ends in themselves. We do X because we think it facilitates Y. And when Y is the case, then it makes Z possible and so on and so forth. There's kind of a chain of events in our minds, a reason why we're motivated to do one thing followed by another, followed by another. And the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle talked an awful lot about this exact phenomenon. He says that if you kind of add all of these things up and sort of go up from uh, this kind of hierarchy of actions from the most basic of things, like eating breakfast in the morning, the reason we do each of those things is always connected with something that we've taken to be higher and higher and higher again. Breakfast allows us to work and work earns us money. Money helps us buy a house. A house becomes a home. In a home, we can raise a family and so on and so forth. A result, a result, a result. But to what end? Aristotle realizes that all of this must point to something that we wish for because of itself. And we wish for all the other things in the chain because of this thing that we wish for for itself alone. And he says, if we could know what that thing was, then like we were archers doing archery with a target, we would be so much more effective in hitting the target if we knew what this thing was. The problem is we can't quite grasp it. But what must be true of that thing at the end of the chain the logical conclusion of all of this action is that this thing, the thing which is worth having above all else, must be irreducible in terms of the things that pull you towards it. And most people never quite chase it down. They sort of progress along the tunnel of life, but never quite understand what the light at the end, which illuminates everything else along the way, actually is. But could it be the case that everything we've been through, this complex tapestry that's emerged in our society over the past six months, is showing in another way that the results we're looking for in life has something to do with relationship. And all the good things we desire along the way actually serve to point us way. Back to Jesus for just a second. The Christian worldview, again, is very interesting about this. Jesus's Sermon on the Mount, which actually contains some of his most uh, famous words, his most famous sayings, well, something that he said as part of that Sermon on the Mount has got an explanatory power um, in this subject area that I think is unrivaled. Jesus is talking to a group of people who do have economic concerns on their mind. But he challenges them with words that maybe you've heard before. He says, life is more than food. The body is more than clothing. And which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your span of life? Your heavenly father knows that you need these things. So look through and beyond them, to see something which should go at the top of your list. One thing to seek first and above all else, which according to Jesus is a relationship with God. Put that relationship with God in the top place and the rest will find its way, find its place in the hierarchy under that. And of course, the Christian claim is that Jesus is 
actually just a few days away from his death on the cross, which opens up the possibility of that relationship with God. So we are relational beings. We're made for relationship with each other. And all the good things that we desire and give ourselves target or targets around in life seem to point us towards that. So results, targets, objectives, getting things done are important and they're part of the picture. But crucially, what Jesus seems to be saying is that we need to expand our view of success beyond results into relationship to get to the end of where all of this leads to take to heart that life is more than food and the body more than clothing and to consider that claim that the very end result we were made for might just be relationship with God. Now it might well be that relationship with God is something you've never properly started or thought was a credible option in the past or maybe you have a description of a relationship with God, but it's kind of just not been a priority recently. Somehow it's ceased to be the most important thing. It's been crowded out by other things. In either of those cases, what we find is that God is there with open arms to welcome us home to relationship with him. And he forgives us when we get things wrong and get things in the wrong order. So we're about to transition into a period of Q&A, and I'm really looking forward to opening the discussion about this together with Jeremy. But just as we were saying, sometimes in life, the things out there can inform a sense of wanting to respond personally and directly in terms of the world in here. We get invitations to change things up, and maybe parts of the challenge of Looking at this new world picture that we have for you could be to open up to the idea of that relationship with God being the thing you were made for. So thank you so much for your kind attention. Really looking forward to getting into some questions now and back to you, Alana. Oh, thank you, Andy. This has really been a breath of fresh air, just a welcome pause. And I've been thinking about just how our glasses were really fogged before the pandemic and how COVID-19 has given us permission to redeem relationships, whether it's with each other or to begin to explore this relationship with Jesus. So thank you. You essentially have brought us to the pot of gold, my friend. I'm going to give Andy an opportunity to catch his breath a little bit. I was beginning to think you might be from France with your expressions and uh, rather than Ireland, my friend. And I want to bring Jeremy into the conversation. Jeremy, you, um, as we indicated, you are a recent graduate from Queen's University working at TD. TD um, trying to develop your career. There's that awkward tension of results and relationships. So is the very essence of what Andy had just spoken about, um, honoring relationships, is that really even palatable? Um, should it even matter? Is it career limiting? Um, I'm really interested in your thoughts. Sure. So I'd like to start, up, start off by thanking RZIM and Intricity for sponsoring this event. I think the ability to answer sort of the big questions of life are so important right now. So this should be a really great, fruitful discussion. Now to your question, I think the first thing we have to do is think about the premise of that question and that in order to succeed in the results-based world, it has to come at the expense of something else, which for many people, it's relationship. Our time is very valuable. And typically that's sort of the resource that we use to invest in either relationships or our work. Um, but I would argue that the you know premise of one has to be in favor of the other is a false dichotomy. Mm -hmm. I think the, the notion around business before everything else has led us to this spiraling out that we're seeing now. And we could really do ourselves a better service by thinking a bit more holistically about our lives. And I actually think that the relationship piece that we're focusing on is so important to augmenting the results piece. We can't separate the two. And when we do that, we really miss out on value across the board. So I, I, I think it's very possible to have both. And I think it's equally important to spend as much time on the relationship piece because that's the only engine that we can have to derive success throughout the course of our life. I think for many people, they're going through this period of COVID where they're facing burnout, stress, and it's, it, it's something that nobody's ever had to deal with before. But having the support of family, friends, our husbands and wives, 
it, it's vitally important to getting through struggle. And I think in terms of a long approach, that's the successful way to think about it. So it's totally possible and doable. It just, it's important to break that sort of false dichotomy we've always sort of thought about. Thanks, Jeremy. So relationship and results can be an integrative model. They do not have to be compartmentalized. I know one thing as an organization that we use as a listener's test, whether or not to move forward with an initiative or not, is if a relationship is going to be hindered, we are not going to pursue that initiative. So that is one of our own listeners. Um, we've got a question that's come in, Andy, and I'm going to boot this one over to you. It's a fantastic question. So why should we reimagine our lives? What will happen to us if we do? Who will we have to leave behind? And will it bring me joy? Wow. <clears throat> what an amazing question. Thank you to whoever has um, taken the time to articulate. Well, there are a number of ways I might be able to, to come at this. Um, the, fun, the first is maybe just with a funny story, which, which might give an, an analogy of how, how I've tended to think about this. And it's actually a story about something very embarrassing that happened to me uh, right at the outset of my career. Um, it was mentioned that I started with one of the big four accounting firms. And in the very first year um, when I joined the graduate scheme, the very first Christmas party that was going to be had, um, I thought that um, it was very important that I be dressed uh, suitably for the occasion and so I went out and I purchased the best tuxedo uh, that I could afford it wasn't very much in those early days but nonetheless it stretched the bank and I was very pleased to be wearing it and uh, very happy that I was looking so good as I turned up at the Christmas party only to find that the dress code was actually smart casual and I was the guy I was tuxedo guy I was actually that guy who turned up wearing black tie at a smart casual event and how embarrassed I was. I can look back now and think that it was very funny, but I think it serves a little bit of a picture of how I see this idea of reimagining success and reimagining what life is really all about. Because we kind of want to wear the right clothes to the right part and we want to match up the way that we live with the way things really are. And so much of the picture of our lives that we kind of inherit or develop or create is informed by the backdrop of what we take reality to be. We have answers to questions about who we are, where we come from and where we're going and therefore how it is that we should live in the middle. And we start to build up really sophisticated and systematic ways of thinking all about that. But from time to time, something happens or there is a reason to revisit those assumptions. You know, in history, some of the most important advances we've had are when people have been prepared to change their minds. I think about the conversation between those who thought that the um, sun revolved around the earth in line with what the guy I mentioned, Aristotle always says, and then what Copernicus put on the equation according to what he observed about other things in reality that suggested maybe we need to change our picture here. So we want to be wearing the right clothes to the, the right party. Um, another way we might want to think about this is we might be wanting to dance the right way to what the music really is. And in many ways, our culture has become what you might describe as a bit of a silent disco. If you've ever been to a silent disco, you'll find it quite humorous to look at from the outside because everyone's listening to a slightly different tune, a slightly different type of music, and they're all dancing according to the tune which they've selected for themselves. It's a little bit incoherent. The thing about reality, though, is that we don't get to define it in that kind of way. Reality is a thing which we discover and we change our lives accordingly. And I think some of the things that we've seen in this coronavirus period give us really good reason to revisit our assumptions about the story we think our lives are part of. In terms of the things which exist objectively, out there, some of these challenges to our stories about ever-growing materialism or materialistic success, and some of the assumptions that we had about our society being one of eternal moral progress in the areas of injustice and inequality, those things seem like they need to be revisited in terms of assumptions. 
But where this question gets really personal and where I think the profundity is for the person who's asked it and articulated it so well is in the area of the story of the felt experience, the desires of our own hearts, the things that we had dreamed of that have been placed there or have come from a deep passion that seem to be somehow threatened by all the things that have happened. There may well be people on this call who have lost their job or they were entrepreneurs whose business is now struggling and there are desires and dreams of the heart which seem like they need significant revision. And this is where I think the uniqueness of the Christian proposition of a relationship with God, the, uh, the author, so to speak, of the story out there, but also um, a father who has an interest in our lives and a love and a care that he wants to show for each one of us as individuals, has the power actually to unlock some of the explanations that we need at the deepest level. We find those things to be true, then it can unlock a joy when we've discovered that kind of truth. And so to the piece about leaving things behind or somehow losing out as a result of redefining our ideas of success in that kind of way, actually, I think it's the opposite, that we get both and, and that light at the end of the tunnel I was talking about, which somehow illuminates everything else along the way. Um, so that would be some brief thoughts about that question. Don't want to be tuxedo guy at Smart Casual Party. Oh, thank you, Andy. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move this one over to you, Jeremy. Um, I've combined two questions together in the essence of time. As an entrepreneur, what are key things to focus on in, an order, and in order to stay relevant in a world of big political correctness. And the next person wants to know, you know, how they can manage corporate values next to personal values. So sure. So those are, right. Those are, those are two really great questions and they're very relevant as you had noted. Uh, speaking to the notion of political correctness that seems so uh, clear in our society today, I think it's important to denote that when we think about the corporate landscape irrespective of our views of if political correctness is good or not, every single corporate has sort of taken political correctness as a business tool to build an image that is cohesive with societal narratives and norms. And as a result of that, as a consumer, or as an employee, it can be very difficult to understand the authenticity or the, the values really undergirding certain actions. So as an entrepreneur, uh, I think this individual is in a, a great has a great opportunity to really define the business and their strategy in a way that has a level of authenticity that corporates haven't been able to achieve just because of how homogenous things have gotten. And I think by offering an authentic perspective of business, you know, being authentic about the values that your business is trying to espouse, it creates a level of business differentiation that is extremely valuable today. It's very interesting when we think about the rise of social media that whole idea about direct-to-consumer marketing was predicated on the notion that brands could be authentic with their consumers. But if we're employing the same types of strategies in terms of messaging, that can get very lost. So I think it always reverts back to you know, being authentic with yourself, being authentic with your business, and that ultimately will be helpful in navigating this world of political correctness that seems to move every which way every other day. Um, so when it comes to the second question, about sort of corporate values and personal values. I, I once again think it's important to not think about this as a false dilemma in the sense that when we go to work one day, we're one person and when we come home, we're another person. I think that's an untenable way to live. And I think for most people, it can be exhausting to feel like you have to put a mask on for eight or 12 hours each and every day. So under that framework, I think it's really important to, as an individual, sort of self audit and think about what are the core values that make us who we are? And then looking towards other areas of our life, seeing how those values can work cohesively with what we're doing. And I think by really being self-aware, understanding our values, and then looking for opportunities to apply them, it really get, it, it gets rid of this idea that we have to live two separate lives or the corporate world in and of itself is this segmented part of um, society that can only be entered into under certain pretenses. So I, I really, once again, I think it goes back to being authentic with who you are and being courageous enough to really <clears throat> focus on bringing your values forward. And that way you eliminate sort of this exhaustion about trying to manage different parts of our lives in different ways. 
Oh, thank you, Jeremy. So self audit, uh, living authentic lives and living uh, through an integrative approach and integrative lens. This next question comes uh, from Peter. Since we are trying to reimagine success, and this is for you, Andy, what shortcoming of how we measured success was exposed by the pandemic? Wow. Well, um, I think I'm going to have to revert to some of those ideas I was suggesting about results and relationship and how it is the case that results can take us so much of the way there, so much of the distance of the, the ways that we want to try and get things done and understand what our lives are really all about. But if we end the story there, then somehow it feels that we haven't quite taken a step into the fullness of what's important and what's most, um, most of our reality and the way that we live. So, you know, some of the concrete examples that you might point to would be this really big difficulty that we've had about how to understand the value of human life and whether or not we should go down the, you know, the route of lockdown, for example, versus what some other countries have done because we want to keep the economy going. There seems to be this kind of irreducible conflict in those two sets of ideas and what should come first? What is the thing which should sit right at the top of our uh, system of values? Um, I was uh, recently reading the, the poem, The Age of Anxiety by W.H. Auden, uh, won the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry in 1948 um, and it's 75 years since the event that that poem was writing about all about the Second World War it's 75 years since that um, event um, came to an end and this poem that the age of anxiety that it tries what it tries to do is explore the different ways that we rationalize things in life and W.H. Auden sets up this conversation between um, four strangers in a New York bar, each of the four strangers representing one of the ways that we as humans try to rationalize the experiences we have. So you have thinking, you have thing, you have intuition, and you have our senses. And they step into this conversation where no real conclusions are reached other than that what we put at the, the top of our considerations is most important. And I think most of the shortcomings that we've seen um, during this time, if it's right to say there have been some, and I think that it is, have been driven by a slightly inept or anemic view of the value of human life and what it is most important to us all. And I've tried to suggest that some of those things find their best explanation in terms of the, the Christian worldview and the way that it would explain them. Thank you, Andy. Our time is coming to an end and we have a flood of questions. And so my commitment, and I'm gonna commit Jeremy and um, Andy to you, is that we are going to get the answers to all of your questions. So if you can give us about 48 hours, we will one by one um, answer those questions because they are important and we value them highly. So I wanna thank you, Andy and Jeremy, for being guests with us today, for your insights. Um, the rawness and authenticity that you have both shared. Uh, it was interesting, yesterday at five o'clock, I went and picked up my, my new glasses. And I almost think that for me showing up today, I had an opportunity to see things from a different perspective myself as the host. So I thank you for the nuggets that I too was able to take away. And sometimes things are cloudy. And this is an unprecedented season. And this is our opportunity to take a pause to explore, to ponder, and give ourselves permission to do that. So we want to continue this journey. As we said from the beginning, this is one of eight of our series on reimagining life's new questions. So next week, we are gonna explore leadership. We have the privilege of having Michael Ramsden, who's the president of our ZIM. And our industry leader will be Mr. Thomas Caldwell, chairman and founder of Caldwell Securities. So we hope you will have the opportunity to join us once again and to consider inviting a colleague and a friend. So once again, thank you on behalf of RZ, I am Canada and Intricity, uh, Andy and Jeremy for joining us and for all of you, our honored guests for being with us today. And for those of you who are in Canada, we wish you a wonderful Thanksgiving. Thank you.